John talked several years ago at um, an event in the local area and learned about B Corps. I was extremely excited about it. He's come back twice and given us updates as more and more states um, add this law to the books. I mean, everybody says, um, you know, you can't change human nature. Maybe that's true. But certainly we see that the uh, society we live under, the codes that we live under, the rules, the regulations, the incentives, hugely affect the way we all behave, and even if we like to think of ourselves as individuals. And um, look at North Korea, South Korea, West Germany, East Germany, you name it, the same people behave very differently under different laws. And I, I happen to believe this law, the, the B Corp, is, is one of probably the most significant uh, laws that if corporations start to incorporate as B Corps that could fundamentally change society. Corporations do a huge amount of good for us. As we know, they're largely motivated by money and that can lead to some bad behavior and this seems to be a fantastic uh, way of changing the way corporations behave, which is billions, the way billions of people behave, I think. So um, I know John has been working on this for years. I've heard many of his talks. It's wonderful. Really looking forward to it. Can I welcome John Montgomery? Thank you. Thank you, Martin. So it's always great to be back here in Palo Alto and speaking before you guys. Um, you've become my favorite audience. Um, and what's really exciting about being here is that um, we are all part of history. We're living this story because um, in the time between my first remarks to you in March of 2013 and now, the Benefit Corporation has evolved significantly into a global phenomenon. And I'm hoping that someday we will all look back and we'll remember these talks and we'll be able to say, you know, remember when? Remember when, when we were there at the beginning of the bee economy? And it was just, as Jeffrey Moore puts it in Crossing the Chasm, it was just a bunch of crazy lunatics, the pioneers and early adopters who saw the promise of this form for transforming the world. And we were all there at ground zero. We, we heard about the story and we watched it unfold. So I'm thrilled to be here today to sort of give you an update as to what's happened in the last year and uh, share with you this story. And I hope that I'll be able to do a good enough job that I'll be invited back next year and that we'll have even more exciting news to share um, as this B economy unfolds. So briefly, I'd like to accomplish five things today. So the first thing I'm going to do is just remind everybody what the Benefit Corporation is. I have a tendency to just assume that everybody knows what it is and move on. So we'll, we'll talk briefly about the Benefit Corporation, what it is. I'll contrast that to the existing corporate form that dominates the global economic system. Um, I'll, I'll talk briefly about what's happened in the last year in the bee economy since our last talk. I'll try to tie this together and explain why the Benefit Corporation and the bee economy is relevant to Silicon Valley. Um, and finally, I have a, a few brief calls to action at the end as to how we can all um, accelerate the adoption of the B economy and, and upgrade the current C economy into the, into a B into, into the B economy. Uh, let's see, uh, Martin, what do I do? What's the uh, button for the next slide? Technical difficulties. Any key? I think these will enter. Enter. Ah, oh, there we go. Undo these arrows too. Okay. So, what is the Benefit Corporation? Well, it's a regular for-profit corporation that has three additional tenets, a public purpose, transparency, and account accountability. And um, one of the things that we're going to do that's different from last year is um, we're shifting from California, which um, I'm personally attached to because I had the privilege of working on the California Benefit Corporation legislation, and switch into Delaware. And Delaware is the corporate 
law leader in the United States and globally. And everybody in corporate law looks to Delaware for precedent and leadership. And Delaware became the 13th state to adopt benefit corporation legislation in 2013 and is likely going to take a leadership role in promulgating this corporate form globally. So we're going to shift our focus from the California Benefit Corporation to the Delaware one. So uh, the Delaware Public Benefit Corporation, and of course Delaware does things its own way, so in every other state it's the Benefit Corporation, but in Delaware it's the Public Benefit Corporation. So the, the Delaware Public Benefit Corporation has to have a public purpose. And in Delaware, that means it's got to operate in a responsible and sustainable manner. And this contrasts to California, where a California benefit corporation must uh, provide a material positive impact on society and the environment from its operations taken as a whole. In addition, in Delaware, a Delaware Public Benefit Corporation has to select a public benefit. And there's an enumerated list of possible public benefits. And these are, these are types of effects on particular classes of, of people. So artistic, charitable, cultural, economic, educational, environmental, literary, medical, religious, scientific, or technological. These are the, the, the public benefits that the company can have. And this public benefit goes in the charter. And uh, this is where the, the Delaware statute gets a little tricky. You know, most of the states have a uh, public purpose, a general public purpose that, that requires a positive impact on society and the environment. And under Delaware, you have the general purpose, which is to operate in a responsible and sustainable manner. And Delaware allows one or more public benefits in your charter. So it's, it's a good idea as a, as a Delaware pu uh, public benefit company to have both environmental purpose and a social one in your charter to make it clear that you're, you're um, abiding by the spirit of the law, which is to provide a, a material positive impact on society and the environment. Um, transparency. Most states require a benefit corporation to measure the provision of that public benefit against a third party standard. In Delaware, that's optional. Uh, there's a provision whereby if, you're, if you want to put your money where your mouth is, you can provide in your charter that the company must measure its provision of the public benefit against a third party standard. Now I'll do a little aside here because the leading um, public third party standard is B Labs certified B Corporation assessment. And companies that pass this assessment are affectionately known as B Corps. And the, uh, the that, that that nickname is also applied to the benefit corporation. So there's a general tendency in the world to conflate a benefit corporation, which is a legal term of art, with a certified B Corp, um, which is a, a company that, or a business that's passed a, a particular third party assessment. And I'll, I'll put a little footnote, because we'll, we'll return to this point a little bit later. So the third piece is accountability. Uh, most states require that a benefit corporation provide an annual report to both stockholders and the public as to how well they're doing with respect to providing a uh, public uh, benefit. In Delaware, uh, there's a requirement to, ha to report every other year to your stockholders and you can provide a charter provision to do more frequent reporting and to report to your um, the, to the public as well. Um, this is where the rubber really hits the road. Um, in a benefit corporation, 
the fiduciary duties of the directors begin to extend to all of the company's stakeholders, not just the stockholders. Um, in Delaware, what this means is that Del the directors must balance the pecuniary interests of stockholders with the um, effect of corporate action on those materially affected by corporate action. So in all the other, in other words, all the other corporations' stakeholders. And the third piece is the prescribed or selected public benefits. So there's a, there's a balancing test. It's not just all about maximizing profit for shareholders. Direct, directors have a new fiduciary responsibility that transcends and includes their, their, the normal one to stockholders. So why is the benefit corporation a game changer? Well, let's look at the prevailing C corporation for a bit. Um, in the words of the current Chief Justice of the <coughs> Delaware Supreme Court, the prevailing corporation exists solely to maximize stockholder welfare. And in this particular form, I, I love these quotes, um, and we'll get, we'll get to the Chief Justice in more detail later. Directors must make stockholder welfare their sole end, and that other interests may be taken into consideration only as a means of promoting stockholder welfare. So what this essentially means is that it's extremely difficult for a director under his or her existing fiduciary duties in a Delaware corporation, and this extends to the corporations of most states, to do the right thing by society and the environment. What Chief Justice Strine is saying is that you can only do the right thing by society and the environment if it's a means to the end of maximizing shareholder welfare. And what's, what's really become clear, and, and here's another quote from Justice Strine, is that treating an interest other than stockholder wealth as an end in itself, rather than an instrument to stockholder wealth, is a breach of fiduciary duty. That's pretty strong language. So um, essentially what this means is it's, it, it's a director in a regular Delaware C corporation risks breaching his or her fiduciary duties to stockholders if they consider interests other than stockholders in corporate actions, i.e. protecting society and the environment. So what this does is it makes the prevailing C corporation prone to sociopathic behavior because directors risk breaching their fiduciary duties if they consider the interests of society and the environment. That's a pretty extreme uh, result. And if you, look at, if you look at what's going on in the world with global warming and everything else, the corporation has become one of the dominant players in our, our, our global village. And, um, you know, if, if we're going to create a sustainable global society, we need corporations that are designed to do the right thing, not only by stockholders, but by society and the environment. And if d directors are prescribed from doing the right thing, that makes the, the task of creating a, a, a more humane and sustainable global economic society pretty difficult. So, in a nutshell, the prevailing C corporation only has a limited profit-oriented conscience. And as I said, it's illegal for directors to do the right thing by society and the environment unless doing so is a means to maximizing stockholder welfare. And this is the, this is the, um, the dirty little codicil of Milton Friedman's ethos where the corporation exists solely to maximize profit for shareholders, which has pretty much been adopted as the global standard. Um, it's that it's morally acceptable to externalize the negative consequences of corporate behavior on society and the environment. You know, this is the global norm. So all of our um, accounting systems focus on financial uh, results 
and don't account for the effect of corporate behavior on the commons. So here's where the benefit corporation is a game changer because it requires the corporation to do the right thing by stockholders and society and the environment. And it provides liability for pr protection for directors to do so. This is a big deal. We'll get back to this point. So these changes make benefit corporations prone to altruistic behavior because they must consider the effect of corporate behavior on all st stakeholders. So the benefit corporation has a social and environmental conscience that transcends and includes the usual profit-oriented one. So here's the fun part. What's happened in the last year since I was here last with respect to the bee economy? Well, we've got benefit corporation legislation in 26 states, including the District of Columbia. It's pending in 14 other states. It's under consideration in Europe, South America, Australia. Delaware is really taking the lead here. Um, Chief Justice Leo Strine, and I can give you the sites later, um, has taken a very active, uh, I would say, marketing role for the state of Delaware by writing um, profoundly influential articles in the Harvard Business Law Review and other journals about the benefit corporation and about um, the, uh, the, the, the status of the current legal system and how difficult it is in the current legal framework for directors to do the right thing by society and the environment. And essentially, um, what Justice Strine has done is draw a line in the sand. And he's acknowledged that there are a lot of people out in the business world who are trying to get corporations to do the right thing. And that the, uh, the, the reality of the existing Delaware corporate law makes it very difficult for corporations to do so. Essentially, what Justice Strine says is that um, you can only, a director can only consider the interests of stakeholders other than society and the environment if it's a means to the end of maximizing shareholder welfare, i.e. maximizing profit. Um, and, and, and that makes it, um, and, and, and he, it makes it clear that it's a breach of fiduciary duty if, if doing the right thing by society and the environment is not directly related to maximizing shareholder wealth. So that's, that's risky. He says that it's okay under Delaware law by the law of contract to make provisions in your articles that change the fiduciary duties of directors, for example. In theory, he says, you could um, provide in your articles that directors could do things differently and that they could consider the interests of other stakeholders. So you can get creative in your legal drafting. But in his experience and in, in, in reality, that doesn't happen. Why? Because we lawyers are very risk averse. We're terrified of anything new. We don't want to subject our corporate clients and their directors to liability. So we're, we're not likely to get creative in drafting new provisions in articles and bylaws when nobody has done it before. And um, directors of public companies are nervous enough as it is about liability exposure that it's perceived that doing things like this adds risk. So that's not a, a viable option. Justice Strine talks about states, and I think there are 31 of them, that have constituency statutes which allow directors to consider in the exercise of their fiduciary duties to shareholders the interests of the corporation's other stakeholders, you know, such as employees, the communities in which the corporation does business, vendors and suppliers, society and the environment. And some of these constituency statutes are quite liberal. Um, in Justice Strine's experience, they, these constituency statutes haven't had the desired effect. They haven't changed corporate behavior. 
and they're not allowed under Delaware law. Delaware does not have a constituency statute. So basically, Justice Stryan concludes by saying that if you want to do the right thing, the Delaware Benefit Corporation provide, or Delaware Public Benefit Corporation, provides a safe harbor and a very legitimate way of doing this. And in um, the article in the Harvard Business Law Review, Justice Strine goes at great length to explain to, to um, people how the law has been set up to provide li express liability um, waivers, not waivers, but limitations on directors in benefit corporations and uh, really signals with these law artic review articles that <laughs> this is a legitimate corporate form and it's here to stay and could have a very substantial impact. So it's very exciting to ha and unusual to have the Chief Justice of a state Supreme Court be proactive about promulgating a new law. It's very, very exciting. What's even more exciting is that Delaware, um, since it adopted its law in 2013, there are over 250 benefit corporations that have, or public benefit corporations that have been incorporated in Delaware. And Delaware is in the process of amending its law to make it easier for public companies to convert into becoming a, de a public benefit corporation. Under current law, it takes a 90% vote of shareholders to convert into a public benefit corporation. And dissenting stockholders have dissenters' rights, i.e. they can have the company buy their stock out if they don't want to be a, a stockholder in a benefit corporation, they can have the company buy their um, shares for fair market value. In the proposed amendment, which is likely to be in effect sometime late this summer, probably in August, uh, it will take a two-thirds vote to convert into a public benefit corporation in Delaware. And if you're a public company, if you're a listed company, the stockholders will no longer have dissenters' rights because they can just sell their shares in the public market. Um, so the benefit corporation is spreading. At this time last year, there were 500 of them in the United States. There have been 1,500 new ones incorporated. And again, 250 of those are in Delaware. Um, transparency and accountabil accounting, accountability is spreading. There, last year, there were about 1,000 certified B Corps. Now there are 1,300 in 41 countries. Um, 17,000 businesses have taken the certified B Corporation assessment. Um, Euro the European Union will require triple bottom line reporting in its public companies with more than 500 employees by 2017. And in the US, we have an organization called um, SASB, the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board, um, which has a very high profile board of directors. I think Mr. Bloomberg is on the board and two of the former commissioners of the Security and Exchange Commission are on the board of directors of this organization. And this, this um, organization is beginning to promulgate accounting standards that begin to create an accounting system that starts to measure the externalized costs of corporate behavior on society and the environment. So, um, uh, this is, this is a, a really important to change the accounting matrix um, to, to really provide transparency for investors to really see what the actual consequences of, of behavior are on, on society and, and the environment. Okay, here's where it gets even more exciting. Um, we now have three publicly traded certified B corporations. Now these are these are these are not benefit corporations. These are businesses that have passed the certified B corporation assessment. Um, Rally Software out of Boulder, 
Etsy out of Brooklyn, and Natura in Brazil. And what's happened with the certified B Corporation certification is that as states pass benefit corporation legislation, B Labs is requiring corporations that are certified as certified B corporations in those states to convert to become benefit corporations by the fourth anniversary of the adoption of the law in the particular state. So Etsy, for example, uh, became a certified B Corporation, I think in 2011 or 12, or maybe it was 2013, and, no, 2011, and Delaware became a, a, a benefit corporation state in 2013. Uh, B Lab has given Etsy and other Delaware companies until 2017 to convert into a public benefit corporation. Whether Etsy does it or not, who knows. But my point here is that we very soon in the United States, we will have our first publicly traded benefit corporation. This is really significant because it will be the first publicly traded company in the US that has legally committed to do the right thing by stockholders, as usual, and society and the environment. And what this begins to do is give us a real choice between doing business with and in corporations that are legally committed to doing the right thing and those that aren't. In the world of investing, you know, right now, we, we would all like to make green investments. We'd all like to make sustainable investments. But it's really difficult to distinguish the pretenders from the contenders. And uh, there's, there's a lot of rhetoric you know, we've got the conscious capitalism movement, which is sort of like the HP way on steroids. And, um, you know, there's the corporate social responsibility, there's impact investing. But when you really look under the hood, it's kind of like when we were in grade school. Because you can't tell, you know, who has crossies. You know, who is, who is um, just using this movement as clever marketing. Um, what I love about the Benefit Corporation is that it causes people to put their money where their mouth is. And they, they put their money where their mouth is and make that legally binding commitment to us, you know, we the people, society, to really tr strive to do the right thing. So, let's, get, let's put, put this in the context of S Silicon Valley. Why does the Benefit Corporation matter to Silicon Valley? Well, I'm just going to do a little aside here. I was a corporate lawyer here for 30 years, and as I got into the Benefit Corporation, I, um, once I figured out what this was and what the implications were globally, I, I, I really couldn't go back to working with conventional corporations. I mean, I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I vir virtually rendered myself unemployable in the conventional C economy because I believe in the benefit corporations so strongly. And when I would explain this to people in the Valley, venture capitalists, investment banks, you know, fellow lawyers, um, they sort of scratched their heads and they go, why would anybody do business this way? I mean, we have it easy now. As, as directors, we only have to juggle one ball, you know, maximize profit for shareholders, you know, and foist as many of the negative consequences of corporate behavior off on society and the environment as we can possibly get away with. That's the game. It's pretty simple. So why would anybody in their right mind want to make it harder? And my God, this Delaware balancing test, I mean, I gotta, I gotta juggle the, the pecuniary interests of stockholders as usual, but I have to start considering the effect of corporate behavior on the other stockholder or stakeholders. 
and 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 blend in this public benefit purpose thing oh that's just too hard and oh my god the liability oh my god the, I what about DNO insurance and we're gonna get sued and you know and, and so I the, the 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 initial reaction to all of this is is, is fear-based because essentially what 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 it boils down to is the benefit corporation challenges the fundamental sponsoring thought in the global civilization about corporations which is that they get a hall pass from um, moral responsibility to society and the environment and that's that's morally acceptable and that the the moral compass of corporations is profit maximization and we've all we've all drunk the Kool-Aid we've all bought into that and what the benefit corporation does is it says wait a minute time out time out let's let's really think about what the philosophical underpinnings of the corporation are and and that those underpinnings may have may have worked in 1811 when New York invented free incorporation and limited liability and started the industrial age but they don't work in an interdependent global economy where it's clear as the Pope said recently that we share one home and we are one people and you know we can't have a model where it's okay to keep externalizing all of the negative consequences of our behavior over there because this is over there it doesn't work so you know I would try those arguments in positions with with you know the, my friends in the venture capital and legal and investment community and I didn't get anywhere I got a got a bump on my forehead but ultimately why this is relevant to Silicon Valley one word money so I'm just gonna name it Silicon Valley runs on fear and greed you know the corporation here exists to maximize profit for the venture capital firms and their limited partners that's the name of the game great I can live with that I lived with that for 30 years it's a fantastic game and we've create we've created so many amazing companies and incredible technologies this is the place of innovation disruptive technologies you know I watch the personal computer the cell phone the browser well guess what the benefit corporation is the next disruptive technology and this is why it's relevant to this community okay the preliminary economic data shows that doing business this way provides a better rate of return to stockholders period and what I like to do when I get to this point is call in the big guns everybody knows Stanford but everybody in the world also knows Harvard so Harvard Business School has a wonderful professor Robert Eccles who has made a career out of studying the effects of sustainability practice on business and business performance and I love directing people to the Harvard Business School website and in particular Robert Eccles biography because Bob has listed so many incredible white papers that you can download for free that that begin to substantiate that businesses that have adopted principles of sustainability such as the benefit corporation provide a significantly better rate of return to investors than their conventional peers it's about five points per year and if you do the math that adds up pretty quickly that's a significant advantage so my sense is oh and and, and I love to cite a couple of books there's Nathaniel Bragdon's profit for life and um, firms of endearment by Raj Sisodia et al which which begin to also make that economic case that businesses that are, are done this way provide a better rate of return so it's another disruptive technology and my sense is if you go back to, to Je Jeffrey Moore and crossing the chasm we've got the early adopters and pioneers companies like like Patagonia um, Ben and Jerry's ice cream um, Etsy rally software um, but what significant bellwether Silicon Valley company is gonna get this and realize 
that, that if they convert into being a public benefit corporation and they're the first, they instantly become the global thought leader in corporate governance. What a cool thing. Um, I don't know if you guys remember what happened when Google adopted its do no evil um, maxim. That automatically catapulted them to the top of the fortune best places to work list. And it got them amazing PR um, that helped uh, spur their growth and success. I think the same opportunity is going to accrue to the first multinational corporation that gets this and says, you know what? If we have the cojones to stand up and say, you know what? Do good. Forget this do no evil stuff. That's namby pamby. That's yesterday. We stand for doing good and by gum, we're legally committed to doing the right thing. And we're going to show the world by converting into a, a benefit corporation. So which VC firm is going to become the champion of the benefit corporation? Axel? Axel invested in Etsy. You know, when, when, the, when the stock catapulted to $31 a share on the opening day of trading, that gave Axel a $325 million paper profit. Now the stock has dipped back below its offering price, but, but still we have, my point is here that we have marquee investors in Silicon Valley that are starting to make investments in certified B corporations and benefit corporations. One of these, the, and, and these guys are, they're, they're financial engineers, they're smart. You know, they understand how to make money. I think it's a matter of months or a couple of years at most before some of these clever venture capitalists figure out, you know what, there's, there's actually a better business model here. Because guess what? Given a choice, who would we the people want to do business with? Somebody that is legally committed to doing the right thing by society and the environment? or somebody who's committed to business as usual. It's kind of a no-brainer, folks. So which company is going to set the global standard by committing to do good? Here's the, here's the big vision. So I think back to how quickly the personal computer took off, how quickly the cell phone became standard, how, how rapidly the, the browser became um, taken for granted. The benefit corporation could be the next disruptive technology. Imagine what the world would be like if all corporations became the equivalent of a benefit corporation. We'd have a very different world because right now the corporation is engineered to be like a car, right? What does a car do? The car emits CO2 and other effluent out the tailpipe. And we all have legitimized dumping CO2 into the commons. Well, think of corporations as designed to put as much as they can possibly get away with out of the equivalent of their tailpipes into the commons. What the, what the benefit corporation model does is it begins to shift that so that we all begin to become stewards of the commons. So, call to action. Uh, this is kind of the same as last year. If you can support certified B corporations, they have a little logo. Unfortunately, I, I ran out of time this morning. I didn't put the logo into, um, into my presentation, but certified B corps have a little B circle with a B in it. Um, encourage companies to become benefit corporations. Spread the word. And, and here's kind of a call to action to Silicon Valley. You know, I challenge Elon Musk, Sergey Brin and Larry Page, Tim Cook, John Chambers, Mark Benioff, and all the other fabulous CEOs that we have here to become the global thought leader in good governance.
You know, and I think it's just a matter of time before one of these guys gets it. And they will have an epiphany that could change the world. Imagine if Tim Cook really got what being a benefit corporation means. What if Mark Benioff figured it out? Mark's done amazing things. He's got quite a social conscience. He seems perfectly aligned with this movement. Same with Elon Musk. Look what he's doing to the, the automobile industry. So that's what inspires me. I think that when I come talk to you next year, my prediction is we will have at least one publicly traded public benefit corporation. And we will have hopefully one, and hopefully that publicly traded company will be here in Silicon Valley. And Silicon Valley has the potential, as it has done so many times, to be the global thought leader in yet another disruptive technology. Thank you. So Sandy, standing over there, is taking a list of people with questions. I'll, I'll go first here and then get Sandy's attention and I'll follow her lead. Yes, um, speaking about um, the fiduciary relationship or necessary of a corporation, let's take any big corporation, the Warren Buffett idea, and the CEO cows the directors into giving him a $50 million a year salary. Whose benefit is that? That is not for the benefit of the shareholders. At least I'm not convinced that you do not get a good CEO unless you pay $50 million. Seems to me if you could get away with half of that, the other half would go to the stockholders and I would appreciate that. They're getting away with that. So how, how can they do that? They're not maximizing the, shake, the, the uh, stakeholders' profits and returns by doing that. Well, I, I'm, in, you know, I'm in violent agreement with the sentiments behind your question. Um, the, uh, the part, part of the issue here is that the uh, corporation is a feudal construct. And if you really look at its legal history, its structure has changed very little since the Middle Ages when the corporation was invented as an agent of empire by the kings of Europe. And the original corporation was used largely as a um, means of organizing mercenary force, commercial forces to conquer foreign territory for the crown and exploit the hell out of them. And the corporation does that brilliantly. And it continues to do that brilliantly to this day. But it has feudal architecture. And the corporate statutes and, and corporate philosophy is embedded with that feudal corporate consciousness. When we had the American Revolution, we threw out the king but the corporate form slipped pretty much unchanged into America because there were only about 50 corporations in the US at the time of independence. So, so the founding fathers really didn't pay much attention to this. So what we have essentially is a corporate form that's imbued with feudal consciousness, feudal exploitative consciousness. And the CEO and director class have, have figured this out that there's no sovereign anymore to keep the corporation in check. We, th we got rid of the king who originally chartered the company or the corporation. In the early days of the republic, leg state legislatures chartered the republic. When New York invented free incorporation and limited liability in 1811, we got rid of that legislative chartering function, which was the external conscience of the corporation. And you know, ever since then, it's been a field day. And we, the people, are the ultimate sovereigns of the corporation. But nobody's minding the store. So, so essentially, the racket in corporate governance is, you know, I am the chairman of the board of the directors. I hire XYZ 
um, compensation consulting service that comes in and for a large fee does a survey of peer CEOs, all of whom make $20 million a year, and we decide, okay, well, our, our peer CEOs are all making 20 million. We can pay our, our peer CEO 18 million, and that justifies what most of us would consider a fairly obscene wage. You know, the tax code used to take care of such things. When I started my legal career, there was a 90%, you know, corporate tax rate once at the, at the top rate. So once you got to that top, it, there really wasn't much incentive to pay people more because it all went to the U.S. Treasury. We don't have that anymore. So it, I, I don't have a solution to it, but, but this is a reflection that we have the, 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 the modern corporation is a feudal institution, so of course we get feudal behavior. And, and the, the CEO is, is essentially a feudal lord. The, the corporation has largely, some of the multinationals have, have largely transcended the nation state. I mean, Apple is, uh, you know, it, it's an enormous um, economic power. It's, it's essentially domiciled in Ireland and um, you know, it's, it's, it, it owes no allegiance to any sovereign. So it's, anyway. Yeah. Uh, two questions. I would like to hear and see you make your call to action that's on the screen on public television in uh, the debates that are broadcast uh, by the Panetta Institute or the Computer History Museum. Have you considered or investigated any way in which you could get yourself invited to participate in those debates? Uh, second question, you mentioned uh, the importance of accounting standards uh, to change corporate behavior and mentioned briefly the EU potential requirement of triple bottom line accounting, which has something to do with externalities. Could you expand on that concept and tell us in more detail what that means? Sure. So first of all, um, I, um, you know, since I rendered myself pretty much unemployable in Silicon Valley with my advocacy for the benefit corporation and the B economy, I have been um, uh, serving as kind of a roving ambassador for the B economy, benefit corporations, and the global consciousness that's coming in behind the movement. So I, I'm not aware of the forum that you mentioned. You know, I would, I would welcome an introduction. I, I do two or three speaking engagements a month to help spread awareness of, of this, um, this evolution in capitalism. So I'd be delighted for any assistance. If you think I'd be a good addition there, I'd be happy to do it. Um, with respect to the EU, um, I don't have a deep personal knowledge of the uh, particular uh, EU statutes, but my understanding is that businesses, the, the, starting in 2017, the EU will begin to require um, triple bottom line reporting in public companies that have more than 500 employees. And what, what's, what's triple bottom line? It, it measures the effect of behavior on people, profit, and planet. And um, what those uh, metrics will look like, um, I can't give you the details, but it's very, very significant because the regulations have requirements that flow down the supply chain. So even though the, the laws are uh, directed towards public companies that have more than 500 employees, it will have a ripple effect throughout the supply chain. And because a lot of those European com companies do business in the United States and may be listed you know, in, on US exchanges, uh, I, I know the SEC and, and U.S. authorities are looking closely at this, um, so, yeah. Sorry, last time, I literally did triple it, people, profit, yeah. What 
should I understand by people, profits, and plant? People presumably includes employees, plant, meaning the facilities of the corporation. Doesn't that include employees? Well, uh, let's, or let's, is it only the emissions? Let, let's take an example of a hypothetical Silicon Valley company that does what all Silicon Valley companies do, which is um, move manufacturing to China. Okay? So, um, right now that manufacturing is, is over there. Okay? And what, what most companies do is they hire a, they don't, they don't set up their own manufacturing operations, they, they do it through a third party manufacturer. And often, you know, we have something called the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, which prevents bribery of foreign officials and so on and so forth. And what, what a lot of companies do is they hire, they hire foreign consultants who are government relations experts. And these government relations experts can do things like um, make sure that the government gets what it needs to ensure that electricity goes to the factory or that, um, that the road to the factory stays clear. Um, when you have a contract manufacturer over there, you don't have to really worry about the um, labor conditions, that's somebody else's issue. You know, look, look, at, look at what happened with Apple and, and Foxcom. Um, you know, Foxcom, a a Apple computers are built in facilities where they have, um, you know, nets on the roof to prevent people from jumping off and committing suicide. And, you know, are the, you know, are, are these labor conditions legal in the United States? Who knows, probably not, but um, it's over there. And, um, you know, China has great air pollution laws and water pollution laws, but the reality is 89 of the 91 cities in China have air that you can't breathe. And, um, uh, you know, it's, it's over there. So what's the true cost of, of manufacturing? And, and the triple bottom line accounting starts, starts to measure what, what's the carbon footprint? What's, what's the true cost of these things? What's the social cost? You know, how many, how many jobs have we lost here to, to move them over there? So it, it, it starts to measure the true cost of making things. Hi, um, can you help me understand why someone like Chief Justice uh, Delaware Strine doesn't simply remove the legal restriction, their actual legal requirement to be sociopathic as a corporation? I mean, it's, it's like a, a legally binary situation where you're either sociopathic or a B Corp. You know, why not simply make it so that corporate attorneys are not fearful to write a charter? It, 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 would be, it would be wonderful if he could, and I think he would if he could, but he, he's a, um, he makes it very clear in his writings that his job is to interpret the law. It's not to make the law. And that we the people have an obligation that if we don't like the law and we don't like the fact that our corporations are essentially engineered to sociopathy, then we shouldn't whine and moan about the current system and try to work within it. We should change the system, which is why he likes the Benefit Corporation. And he uses in one of his um, uh, law review articles the example of tax arbitrage. You know, um, I'm a, a, a trustee in an investment trust that had a position in Medtronic. And Medtronic is a fantastic company, or I think was, um, Minnesota-based, started in 1949, it's got like the Hewlett Packard story, started in a garage. The founder came up with the corporate mission. And that corporate mission was the company's North Star for 50 plus years. They had core values, you know, and one of the tenets of their corporate mission was to be a good corporate citizen. Well, Medtronic and Corp bought um, Covidian last fall and they redomiciled the, the combined company in Ireland, primarily to avoid paying Minnesota and U.S. tax, or to reduce the U.S. and and Minnesota tax burden. And by by redomiciling in Ireland, 
All of the foreign subsidiary profit um, is no longer subject to U.S. tax. That's about 40% of 40% of the combined company's revenues are from operations overseas. So, what Justice Stride essentially said, he he, he gave an, he didn't use the Medtronic example, but he talked about tax arbitrage in general, and he basically said, yeah, there are a lot of people that whine and moan about this stuff being unpatriotic and being sociopathic, but you know, tax arbitrage like that is that the directors are basically they, they have to do it. Their their job under Delaware law is to maximize share, shareholder welfare. And tax arbitrage is a legitimate strategy. And if you don't like it, write your congressman and senator and change the tax laws. So what I love about J Justice Strine is he is such a no bullshit guy and he is so smart and he just basically he, he basically um, lays it out for everybody in such clear terms that um, we begin to really see that we all are soon going to have a choice. Do we vote with, do, do, we, do we do business with and in businesses that are legally committed to doing the right thing? Or are we doing business with and in businesses that um, maybe, but are, are legally required to maximize shareholder welfare? So most likely, their, their hands are tied to really being able to do the right thing. Hi, uh, I actually uh, am interested in this from the perspective of uh, currencies because uh, in Silicon Valley we're not just using uh, legal tender in the form of federally, uh, Federal Reserve issued cash, but we're using Bitcoin and there are projects such as metacurrency. So uh, in the future, if you're talking social disruption, we uh, can't just structurally enforce the law through cash because, you know, there are billions of dollars being made illegally and oh yeah a little bit of that will throw into the B economy so we look good meanwhile how much cash is flowing around the world illegally so electronic currencies uh, are a way to consider structurally enforcing uh, legal tenders either in the form of vouchers or in my opinion the meta currency project which you may want to investigate cool Uh, hi. Um, uh, let's take your example of someone like Elon Musk, you know, who, with Tesla, who's probably the, the most environmentally friendly person on the planet. Uh, if, if I'm Tesla and I become a B Corp, am I not opening myself up to lawsuits from every environmental nutcase who wants to sue me about everything like leather seats or something like that? And is there a way that I could have some immunity from sh shareholder lawsuits over I'm not maximizing my profit but not open myself up to other lawsuits that would just basically waste my time and resources when I'm already doing the right thing anyhow. Right. Um, the, the, um, a couple of things. One is the benefit corporation laws while they generally extend the fiduciary duty of directors to all the corporation's stakeholders, um, they, they take great pains to make it clear that, that those um, stakeholders don't have standing to sue. So um, uh, the, the idea behind the law was to make it safe for existing companies to adopt the law without taking on additional liability. And um, there's some goodies in the Delaware law that make it attractive to existing companies. So there's a, there's a particular section of the, of the public benefit corporation law that outlines the liability safe harbor for directors in uh, public benefit corporations. So they, they, they have all of the traditional Delaware protections of the business judgment rule and there's a particular um, articulation of, of, of um, liability carve out for directors in um, benefit corporations to, to, um, to do the right thing, to do the balancing test. Um, so um, the, other, the other thing that's interesting is 
There's a doctrine in Delaware where if in a mergers and acquisitions context, if a company is up for sale and there's an auction situation, there's a case called Revlon which basically required the a Delaware corporation to sell itself to the highest bidder. And um, that, in, in the case of Ben and Jerry's, they ended up getting sold to Unilever and there was a, I think that Ben and Jerry wanted to uh, do a, you know, a buyout and their offer was less than Unilever, but they were forced to sell the company to um, a corporation that didn't necessarily share their values. Under, under the benefit corp public benefit corporation law in Delaware, there's an express carve out from Revlon. So you can, um, you can sell companies to, um, you, know, you can sell your company to um, the, um, a, a business that's, that's aligned. And then the new, I think the new um, amendments to the Delaware law will make this even clearer, so. Uh, you mentioned that somebody did a study and found that the B Corps were actually more profitable. And what I wondered is, what, what is the differences that caused that to happen? I mean, maybe they lowered the compensation for the CEO, but that doesn't make 5%. Uh, is it the, a change in the employee structure? Is it because more people buy B Corp products? Did they? Do any of that study? Um, well, first of all, the study didn't. It, it wasn't particular. It wasn't specific to benefit corporations and certified B corps because when the study started, the certified B corporation assessment and the benefit corporation legal form didn't exist. So, so I'm talking about um, Bob Eccles. He did a 20-year study and he, he basically studied um, the effect of principal the, the effect of um, investor return in businesses that adopted principles of sustainability. And he, and he basically had a, a conventional peer group in particular industries and then business, compared those with businesses that adopted principles of sustainability. And what he found was you know, about five points a year greater return. Um, there, there's a book, uh, Conscious Capitalism, um, which has an appendix in the back that has um, kind of um, a high level view of, of why doing business in this way provides a greater level of return. For example, um, I think Stonyfield Farms found, there were organic dairy products. They found that um, they had to pay more to farmers for organic milk. Um, it was more expensive, and they, um, but, but, they they had to spend almost nothing on marketing, because the story was so compelling that people that that what the extra spend that they made to buy organic and and do business organically was more than made up by the reduction in um, marketing spend. Another example is employee turnover. Um, you know, em employee loyalty is really tough, especially among millennials. Millennials do not want to work for a traditional corporation that exists to maximize profit for shareholders. You know, my generation complains about millennials and how terrible they are in the workplace. They're not terrible. They want to work for a company that makes a difference. They want meaning in their, in their jobs. So if you want to you want to minimize employee turnover and and attract some of the best people. Um, this is a this is a good way to you know good way to do things. Anyway, those are those are two examples. So uh, lunch is ready. Just a reminder that the table with the red tablecloth, John will be sitting there. If you've got more questions, you could let him grab his lunch rather than holding the questions and let him sit down. Then you can go and ask there. That would be great. Thank you very much indeed. So, Thank, thank you all very much, and let's create the bee economy.